welcome, formally welcome you to the JBI Live webinar. Um, today we are talking about qualitative synthesis and bringing experience to action, which I know is a very popular topic and we see the value of qualitative synthesis, but how do we bring that experience and the synthesis that we've developed from that experience into action, into our policy and our practice. And, and Craig is probably the best person to be able to speak at, about that. So welcome to the JBI Live webinar series on qualitative synthesis. So today I'm just going to go through a bit of housekeeping, uh, but first I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. Also, whilst I'm doing this acknowledgement of country, please, acknowledge the country that you are on, knowing that we are a truly global community here, also acknowledge um, which Indigenous lands you are on. So for us, we would like to acknowledge that this land um, that we meet on today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge that the Ghana people are the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. So please within the chat also acknowledge which lands that you are on today um, and so that we can acknowledge the global community that we have. Any feedback about this webinar, we will do a formal evaluation at the end but feel free to also send your thoughts and opinions to JBI Education at adelaide.edu.au. We also love to engage with you over Twitter. Craig in particular is a big tweeter um, and would love to see you um, talk about the webinar and continue the discussions that we may bring up today. So hashtag JBI Live, web, um, JBI Live will allow us to be able to track those conversations but also feel free to tag um, JBI, which is at JBI EBHC, and also Craig and myself, and we will hopefully be able to get back to you um, relatively quickly today. We'll be on uh, Twitter to be able to answer any more responses that you may have, or even just tweet that you're in this webinar um, and your thoughts and opinions. We'd, we'd love to see it on Twitter. So, now that we have done the formal housekeeping, I have the great honour of being able to introduce Dr. Craig, uh, Associate Professor Craig Lockwood. So Associate Professor Craig Lockwood is a Director in Implementation Science within the Faculty of Health Sciences at JBI, the University of Adelaide. He's also an Adjunct Associate Professor in the Queen's School of Nursing in Kingston, Ontario. We saw some people from Canada here today. Dr. Lockwood, he is passionate about qualitative synthesis methodology, and he was also the lead author of the JBI Guidance of Systematic Review of Qualitative Evidence. He is also the chair of the Jack Qualitative Synthesis Methods Group. He is responsible for the JBI strategic and specialist content for web-based platforms, tools, and resources for implementing evidence into practice at the point of care for the health professions. They are currently being used on over 9,000 health services around the world to facilitate the transfer of knowledge to policy and practice. So I am going to shop, stop sharing my screen and I am going to hand over the reins to Dr. Craig Lockwood. Okay, well, it, it, I appreciate the introduction. I uh, love working with Danielle, it's fantastic. Um, and to be talking with you now online is amazing as well. So friends and colleagues, it's really great to be with you for this talk. Uh, you might've been following the series for a while. The JPI Live series has opened up some amazing topics, some interesting challenges as well. And I actually think in that context, today's is fairly big. Uh, but working with the awesome Danielle Pollock and all of you on the end of the line as well, I'm sure we're going to do just fine. This is the kind of topic that does sort of make you think a little bit harder and a little bit further about something that you might otherwise take for granted almost. Uh, and arriving at this talk has clarified some ideas for me about JBI's approach to qualitative evidence synthesis, 
um, partly why is this unique in the world of qualitative evidence synthesis? And a secondary question, why is it a bit contentious? So hopefully by the end of today's talk, we've addressed both of those points to your satisfaction. But as Danielle said, we'd love to hear more from you through the talk and after the talk as well. So go mad with Twitter and hashtags. Feel free to take screen captures as well anytime you like. Um, these are my disclosures. As you can see, I'm a director for JBI and, and where and how I work. Where we're going today is uh, important, I think, and interesting. So we want to talk about the importance and reasoning for conducting a qualitative evidence synthesis by framing that in its full context first, how to go about doing so, and then considering the experiential knowledge that arises from a qualitative evidence synthesis, how it can be formed into meaningful meaningful and actionable recommendations for policy and practice change. So that's our broad direction. Daniel's also told me I have to keep to time, which is something I actually struggle with, but your academics as well, you can relate to this. Uh, the, I think the thing that I find interesting as a segue into a topic like this is to situate it within the broader context of how people perceive see and understand qualitative research. And I'm doing that today by focusing on a letter that uh, was sent to the BMJ editors on qualitative research. 76 senior academics from 11 countries, uh, led by Trish Greenhow, um, wrote an open letter to BMJ editors to reconsider their policy of rejecting qualitative research on the grounds that it was perceived as low priority. Instead, in their, their open letter, they challenged the journal to develop a proactive and scholarly, a pluralistic approach, if you will, to research that aligns with its stated mission. They said, and I quote, we are concerned that the BMJ seems to develop the policy of rejecting qualitative research on the grounds that such studies are low priority, unlikely to be highly cited, lacking in practical value or not of interest to our readership. I think that must have hurt a little bit to receive uh, that information. The, the authors of the letter, open letter then argued that BMJ should develop and publish formal policy on qualitative and on mixed methods reviews, uh, research, sorry, and that this should include appropriate and explicit criteria for what kinds of include uh, criteria should be considered for inclusion. Um, of course, BMJ responded to this and uh, Liz Loder and Trish Gross, who are two excellent academics uh, and editorial leads, interestingly replied, and I've just highlighted here for your attention, uh, there's a lot in that, but qualitative studies are usually exploratory by nature and do not provide generalizable answer. Now, if you're online and you've got a quantitative background, you're probably thinking, well, that makes sense. But if you're qualitative, you've probably already got five lines of argument in your head about why you disagree so strongly with that view. And not surprisingly, there were a number of views that disagreed. They could be characterized in a particular way, though. Uh, Pecori, for example, highlighted the value of qualitative research in terms of its complementary role to quantitative evidence. It answers patient clinician questions about what works best for who in what circumstances, for example. And they also drew attention to the need to continuously improve the quality and applicability of findings. And this characterized quite a lot of the debate and discussion that arose at that time. And there was a second line of argument characterized across the respondent literature as well, which was really to focus on analogous framing, in this case, generalizability, transferability, uh, and also to challenge existing assumptions around randomized control trials, how truly generalizable are they anyway? And so uh, many responses debated terms such as generalizability in their meaning, arguing that theory is a pragmatic research output 
And all of these responses are, of course, quite correct. <laughs> it's not surprising that there was a robust response, but they also do something interesting for us today. That is that they demonstrate a continued uneasy partnership between qualitative work and the dominant paradigm of our day, which is evidence-based healthcare. So where and how do we start to bring those two together? Today's talk has challenged me to think about it within the framework of experience to action, thinking about implementation. So to think about implementation, we need to agree to what it is to some extent. So Professor Carl May, uh, his background is in medical sociology, uh, research on health technology and human relations. He, as you can see on screen now, he did a, a, des a design and an outlay. This is in a talk that he gave about two weeks ago. So this is very recent. Uh, implementation is the translation of strategic intentions by one group of actors into the everyday practices of others. And if you follow the flow down, you can see it may lead to normalization of practice change or it may not. Um, and that's the, the nature of how that process operated for them. Equally, you can see on screen, you've got the model that I, maybe you're already familiar with the JBI model, which is a model for evidence-based healthcare, where a component of that that is integrated with, with all the other elements such as synthesis, transfer, et cetera, is that uh, evidence implementation includes context analysis, facilitation of change, and evaluation of uh, process and outcome. So two domains of outcome measurement that are highlighted, process and outcome, we will come back to them a little bit later as well. So it's useful for framing to think about implementation uh, of qualitative evidence within an operational definition. And this actually has helped uh, with a pragmatic conceptualization of JPI's approach to qualitative evidence synthesis, which I hope becomes clearer as this talk goes along. But why is this an uneasy partnership? What is so difficult in thinking about the role of qualitative research in terms of evidence-based healthcare practice change and getting that message out to a broader community. There's a lot of what we might call known knowns, um, such as qualitative, sorry, synthesis. Qualitative synthesis can be used to fill important knowledge gaps identified through quantitative reviews. In this way, a qualitative synthesis might complement an existing published quantitative review. There's good examples of that in the literature. It can also address questions that arise during a quantitative review that might even influence or shape the direction of the review, or, or as some examples have previously demonstrated, help reinterpret findings with greater theoretical power. So why is it lesser known that a standalone qualitative evidence synthesis can provide evidence for evidence-based healthcare at the point of care for bedside clinicians? Well, we have to go backwards to go forward sometimes. And briefly, that's what we're going to do, starting by acknowledging there's a huge body of primary qualitative research that is not directed at the information needs for, of policy and practice. There's a lot of genuine scholarly inquiry. It's, it's important work, but it's outside the domain of informing clinical decision-making in care. So what we have when we have qualitative evidence related to a topic is actually a somewhat limited data set to work with. Uh, and I think that's worth considering when choosing a methodology for qualitative synthesis, given we don't have a lot of data, uh, maybe methods that don't limit the data set available have more utility in a more controversial in qualitative systematic review. In JBI, so the JBI methodology is what we're talking about today. A qualitative synthesis is based on a comprehensive search. And that's part of our response to this problem of, we have a limited data set to begin with. And, and then we 
if we take other approaches that limit that, then we're working with an even smaller set of data to try and inform decision making at the point of care. And I think intrinsically that's difficult for clinicians to get their head around. Why aren't we looking at the fullness of the available data? Why are we looking at a part of the data? Um, to really help make sense of where this approach that JBI has adopted comes from, I just need five to seven minutes of your time to talk about what I'm calling the antecedents. So what is it that underpins the nature of the, the methodology and informs uh, how it works in essence? That's where we're gonna go now. So Trish Greenhow and colleagues in the BMJ, they indicated knowledge has a basis in traditions. What they were trying to do was to shake the tree of tradition a little bit. It's very difficult to shake that tree unless you know the shape of its roots. And that's why I now want to spend a few minutes talking with you about the, what I'm calling the epistemic imperatives and philosophic traditions that are antecedent in JBI's approach. Now, if it's 4 a.m. in the morning for you in, in uh, I think it was in India, good luck with this session. And like Danielle said, I hope you have your cup of tea handy. But let's take a look anyway. Um, in, in the way we consider uh, quality of evidence synthesis, the philosophic perspectives that underpin it are transcendental phenomenology and pragmatism. As you can see on screen, significant work's been done on this topic previously. Uh, and thinking through that open letter to BMJ became a really good opportunity to see how does that work integrate with current thinking? Uh, so in working that through, I think the antecedent condition I want to come back to the most in this talk is perhaps described as interconnectedness. Um, and in JBI QES, there is a connection between specific philosophic perspectives that you can see on screen methodology, method, and the desired intent, which is actionable knowledge that can be used for implementation. Now, uh, some of these publications have really delved quite deeply into that work. My colleague, uh, Dr. Carly Porritt, did a superb PhD thesis on the historic emergence of qualitative synthesis, for example. So, a lot of this work is in the public domain already. We, we've established that JBI's approach is aligned with transcendental phenomenology with its origins in Husserl's phenomenology in particular. And this, uh, this to some extent was expanded and adapted by Merleau-Ponty, although he was an existentialist, he had a strong belief in the power of description. And the power of description is a key driver in transcendental phenomenology to get knowledge to inform action. Uh, so uh, you might really find that a difficult statement to embrace or uh, come to terms with. So use the chat, use Twitter to tell us what you think. Um, and equally guiding this, of course, is pragmatism as a philosophic foundation, where uh, in a journal of advanced nursing paper we, we published some years ago, the foundation of the core interest was the practical utility or usability of the methods and the findings to create actionable knowledge. So very briefly then, because I, I did promise to be brief on this, uh, Transcendental Phenomenology uh, looks at a range of unique experiences. You'll be familiar with this already, but within each unique experience, there is a larger transcendent experience that is more essential and unvarying. There's a consistent quality to it that is above the level of the individual's authentic lived experience. And establishing meaning uh, from within a, uh, a transcendental perspective involves understanding the experience as it's posited epistemologically or in a knowledge-based perspective where the knowledge is greater than the sum of its parts. And this is characteristic of a phenomenological attitude and what we would call intentionality in a JBI qualitative evidence synthesis. So this aligns 
very, very well, because it's epistemologically driven by knowledge, it aligns very, very well with pragmatism. Uh, pragmatism, we did some work in 2011, uh, looking at how JBI's qualitative evidence synthesis approach is sensitive to practicality and usability. More recently, uh, an interesting paper has come out by Kelly and Quaridio on three pillars of pragmatic research, emphasis on actionable knowledge, recognizing the interconnectedness of experience, knowing and acting, and inquiry as an experiential process. Uh, so this emphasizes the, the principle of actionable knowledge as the starting point for research or in our language, qualitative evidence synthesis, to enable that work to be anchored in respondent experience and hence ensure that there is practical relevance derived from that experience. This being anchored is actually one of the contentious things about a JBI qualitative evidence synthesis. For some people, it's a limitation and they want to do different kinds of exploration and follow different paths. I actually think those people would prefer a more ontologically driven approach. But in JBI, it's a strength because it, it, it allows a fixed question to be transparently conducted and reported through to end users in a way that can be confidently communicated to make the findings useful for practice. So if I were to try and frame a summary perspective on what are those antecedent uh, conceptual parameters and how do they come together, it's understanding that different methods of synthesis have a different purpose. They're not necessarily just the same glove in a different color when you go to put gloves on on a cold day. So synthesis uh, from JBI's point of view is intended to lead to actionable knowledge as the basis of recommendations for policy and practice. The method, uh, you can see the dominant unit of analysis is the text from that limited pool of studies that we said is always available and it's underpinned epistemologically by transcendental phenomenology and pragmatism. So what would I say? I would say choose this methodology if your intention is to produce actionable knowledge for clinically orientated policy and practice. Uh, and you can do so knowing that the epistemic roots or traditions are, in are well geared to uh, facilitate and assist in that process. Of course, it's easier to talk about this, but there's nothing quite so practical as a good example. So we're going to go uh, for the next few minutes through an example. Uh, is a systematic review that had a, a significant qualitative arm. I, I should tell you the example is based on stillbirth. And for some people that might be uncomfortable, um, I'm sorry if it is, um, but I, I am intentionally focusing on the question and methods and results, how those become actionable knowledge rather than delving deeply into stillbirth as a phenomena or an experience that you may have had yourself. So let's look at this. This was a piece of funded work. This is a qualitative evidence synthesis that informed the development of clinical practice guidelines. Uh, and I've, I've put that information on screen for you so you can see it. The challenge for us is that in describing a qualitative evidence synthesis, it necessarily, and I've never worked out how to do this differently, it necessarily sounds like I'm talking about a linear process, but I'm not. This is just for clarity and communication. It's not formulaic, uh, but it does show you um, how applicable to, to care delivery, to actionable knowledge, um, the JBI approach can actually be and to assist people. So the outputs are really targeted very specifically. Uh, Hands-on knowledge of how people experience the healthcare sector is invaluable in a multidisciplinary context. Uh, it enables a shared understanding of the meanings that people attribute to their engagements and interactions with health professionals plus the system. And it gives us a deeper understanding of uh, the meanings that people attribute to their experience so that 
If we are in a position to facilitate, create, or co-participate in change, that change within an evidence-based healthcare model is underpinned by knowledge of the meaningfulness of experience that people go through. Um, so that's a really valuable basis and position for a qualitative evidence synthesis. Uh, and let's let's take a few minutes now, and I'll try to use my hands less. Let's take a few minutes to talk about how that looked in this particular review. So on screen, you can see uh, the review topic was providing care for families who have experienced a stillbirth. It was actually a comprehensive review. So it looked at qualitative and quantitative evidence to address different questions. I've unpacked that down to just the qualitative questions and methods. So the question was, what are families' experiences of interventions and strategies? aimed at improving psychological well-being following stillbirth. Then the inclusion criteria followed the JBI PICO for qualitative reviews, which is to really in a detailed way, a priori define the population, the phenomena of interest and the context. So all of those were unpacked um, in quite a lot of detail. The methods, as you can see in summary there, a comprehensive search find all of the literature and don't, uh, don't feel um, satisfied until you're confident that you've got a strong representative body of literature. Independent study selection by multiple authors on the review project. So this relates to transparency and auditability as does uh, independent critical appraisal. In JBI, critical appraisal evaluates congruity and dependability enabling us to exclude studies that are of low quality, which is a requirement in a, a JBI review. So the analytic process is about extraction of findings. Uh, and this is the link between the, the methods and the synthesis phase of a review. The findings are given a level of credibility. I'll show you what that is a little bit later. It's really a three, three phase analytic process moving from establishing the findings through categorization into synthesized findings that can be used as the basis of knowledge to inform recommendations for policy and practice. If this looks like methods of a systematic review to you, then you're correct. It is unapologetically aligned with methods for systematic review. The question and or the aims are, are co-created with the key stakeholders informed by their knowledge, needs, and priorities. The inclusion criteria similarly are developed to guide the review and operationalize the question. They're not a starting point for further exploration. They're actually the guiding lion down which that automated vehicle, well, that's a bad analogy, I won't use that. Searching is comprehensive and exhaustive within available resources, uh, don't list 58 databases if you only have access to two, for example. And data extraction follows specific criteria and operational definitions. So if you're familiar with reviews, you can readily be familiar with this methodology, I think is a, a nice summative point to make just right there. So how does it work? Well, having talked through the methods, I'd now want to park those, leave them behind and get more into the process. Some of you are familiar with this, which is great. And you can tweet about it and you talk about it in the chat as well. But for those that are not, uh, finding the findings is data extraction, but the findings are also the first step in synthesis, right? So to find findings in this exemplar, the qualitative papers had to be read and reread multiple times quite closely to find the actual findings. Findings are analytic data. So they might be uh, themes, they might be metaphors, or they might be buried in a table or in text. It, it's a different type of reading to get the findings out of a qualitative study than it is out of a quantitative study. Yeah, the findings are extracted with what's called an illustration. And in qualitative research, what you're looking for really is a quote. So some voice from a participant that represents a connection with the, the theme or the metaphor or the analytic data. 
in this particular review, there was a, a lot of included studies. So there were 20 studies related to the question around families' experiences of interventions and strategies to improve psychological well-being following stillbirth. So that's, that's a lot. From those uh, 20 studies, 209 findings were extracted and pulled out and managed. We have software for that called JVI Summary. You should look it up, it's amazing. Um, but those findings, when we talk about the analytic process, we go from a large pool of findings down to a smaller pool of what we call categories. So the findings were rated based on quality, and then they were categorized together. So they're reduced, it's a, a, a transcendental reduction um, into categories based on similarity and meaning, where the review team determine what do we mean by meaning? How are these findings related to each other? Uh, categorization is where the re review team really sit down, they explore their findings in full, they look for patterns in the data that lead to meaningful descriptions of how particular findings relate to each other. Uh, from there, uh, so from categorization, the review team move on to the final step of the analytic phase, which is to develop synthesized findings. So as you can see on screen, categories were subject to metasynthesis in order to produce a comprehensive set of synthesized findings. And these can be used as the basis of evidence-based practice. Five, 42 categories, five synthesized findings um, relevant to the overall experience of stillbirth it was a complicated question. So they actually had to go from virtually pre-diagnosis to people's experience many years after that as well. And I'm going to show you just one. So there were five metasyntheses or synthesized findings. We're just going to look at one and, and see where we land from there. So here you can see it on screen. I won't read it to you. But what it does do is it highlights factors that influence and relate to parents' experience of the intervention and strategies that they, that, they, that they get during their care, during their engagement with the health system, uh, even from the point of diagnosis or pre-diagnosis uh, forward over time. And time can be years in advance, as we just saw. So this really emphasizes the important role that health professionals play in sensitively and genuinely preparing parents for the various stages, processes, experience and events that they encounter throughout the entire lived experience of stillbirth. There is a sense of actionable knowledge here as well, and I'm sure you can see it. The sense is of actionable knowledge, sorry, the sense of actionable knowledge is evident in the identification that implementation and, and and therapeutic care should be delivered with sensitivity, with genuineness, and with consideration of the individual's needs. Uh, this actually then extends further as well. And I, I want to get to that with you next because the talk is about from experience to action. So we've now, we've collected a lot of experience. What and how does it look like when you start to transition that experience to action? So we'll look at that just in the next two slides. And then in the last few minutes, I want to spend some time talking about, given that there is a uneasy relationship between qualitative synthesis and evidence-based healthcare as a paradigm, what are some mechanisms for improving confidence in the results and the transferability of qualitative findings into policy and practice for application by health professionals? So that's where we're going in uh, the next few minutes. A number of recommendations came out of the qualitative findings in, in this piece of work. Uh, so you, I've just listed here to tie back to the synthesized finding, which was around sensitive, genuine and em empathetic care. These three recommendations came from that. So, you, and you can see the wording of these lends themselves to implementation and to uptake by a practicing health professional. Uh, it gives them advice and information they might not have considered otherwise. You know, we, 
people do value having close family or friends around them at different times in their health journey. So these implications were based on the best available evidence from this comprehensive JBI qualitative evidence synthesis. They're derived directly from that synthesized information, as well as from expert and consumer representative voices and input. Um, the implications were operationalized as recommendations to inform health professionals, clinical decision making. Uh, and this also contributed to um, some guideline related work. And from this qualitative review, uh, recommendations were developed across, what is there, six, six different domains of decision making. Uh, you can see those on screen, so I won't read, won't read them. The guideline recommendations uh, arising from this work were, were localized by the steering committee that oversaw the entire project. Equally though, the recommendations can be used as quality indicators in case studies or organizational order and feedback projects, where the indicator itself can be used as the recommendation. And how that indicator is measured in the local is, is defined and then operationalized, that's the local contextualization. There's, there's actually, if you're interested in that, there's many examples of this in the journal JBI Evidence Implementation, where recommendations are used as quality indicators directly, and the localization occurs with how do we measure this? How are we going to measure this in our setting? Uh, that's a, a remarkable adaptation for qualitative evidence synthesis. Um, it's important though to align it with the ability to communicate confidence and clarity around that transfer process into action. And that's where I wanna take us just in the last couple of minutes of my talk. I keep saying last couple of minutes because I'm worried about going over time. Uh, all of this, as you will see, is about communication. It's about illustrating the trustworthiness and dependability uh, integrated within the methods of reporting in a JBI qualitative evidence synthesis. Um, and two core concepts apply here, and I'm going to touch on them because I think you'll be somewhat familiar with this already. So similar to other review types, systems to rank confidence in the findings of system, qualitative reviews are very important. This ranking can be considered really a rating of confidence in the qualitative synthesized findings. We call it conqual, where confidence is considered to be belief or trust that a person can place in the results of the research. The ranking applies to each individual synthesized finding, so it's granular, it's detailed, it's in depth, uh, and different synthesized findings in the same review might have a different ranking. So what do we mean by credibility? Credibility in this process uh, addresses whether or not a finding has been represented correctly. So it's about representativeness. Um, and in, in our approach, this enables a reviewer to look at and determine the, uh, to look at and determine the degree to which the interpretation of the research is credible. Uh, and this is important, going back to that original point, we don't have a lot of research, qualitative research on policy and practice. We only have a limited volume of data. And when we're analyzing it, we actually don't have the full transcript. We just have what was published. So uh, determining credibility is really critical to uh, acknowledging whether or not the interpretation of the author's findings was an appropriate representation of participant voice. This is done during the use of the JBI software summary. There's three levels of credibility, uh, but I want to take you on quickly through the last final section of slides. The second major domain is dependability. There are five questions in the JBI critical appraisal instrument that uh, address dependability. You can see it's about appropriateness, and the focus is on consistency and quality. Um, importantly, as with credibility, it should be logical, traceable, and clearly documented. Of course, once you define and operationalize these things, you can measure, rank, and rate them. If you're really interested in that, there is a good paper that was led by uh, Associate 
Professor Zachary Munn on the Conquol scoring, and it's in the reference list that's provided after this talk as well. But if you want to move this into actionable knowledge, one way to do that is to provide people with what we now consider to be a summary of findings table. Uh, and this conveys to the reader all the key information that was developed through that review process. So the context is not lost. That's a really important point to make. The synthesized findings are outlaid along with what kind of research informed each of those synthesized findings their dependability score, credibility score, then an overarching Conquol score for each synthesized finding and explanatory text that helps make sense of how it all worked. Overall, what uh, I hope I've been able to convey to you today is that the JBI method for qualitative evidence synthesis has a focus on Trans three, really three key principles, transparency, trustworthiness, and dependability. And, and for us, because we're coming from an epistemologic perspective on how knowledge is perceived and able to be used in practice, so a transcendental perspective, we take a comprehensive approach to searching and selection in order to facilitate evidence-based healthcare by a descriptive analytic process that focuses on the experience as published. Um, it is by design responsive to questions that arise from really complex experiences in clinical care. Uh, and you know, stillbirth is a, a, a particularly complex experience, right? Yeah. So yet to see a, an approach able to bring that information together in a meaningful way is really quite significant. So uh, responsive to complex questions, able to generate credible, dependable, meaningful knowledge of a phenomena that relates to people's uh, healthcare practice and able to be applied in a cross disciplinary fashion as well. Uh, this is how JBI not only concept conceptualizes, but operationalizes the transfer from evidence sorry, from experience to action. Uh, and it's, a, it's driven, as you now know, um, philosophically, but also by our mission. Uh, our mission is to promote and support evidence-based healthcare globally. Qualitative evidence synthesis is intrinsic to this mission. So if you're a fan of qualitative evidence synthesis, get on board with a JBI mission. Um, and I think I'm done at this point. So I hope that that's been useful. And I hope we've got time for questions. Danielle, how are we going? You definitely have time for questions. Um, you did amazing at keeping on time. So thank you so much for that. It's much appreciated. Um, we do have quite a few questions coming in. Um, so bear with me as I just sort them out just a little bit. Um, First thing is from uh, Peggy who asked, how can we determine an exclusion criteria based on low quality evidence? And should, I'm gonna throw it out there, should we exclude based on low quality studies? Yeah, uh, Peggy, thank you for that question. I'm just gonna go home now. Um, it's actually a really challenging question. Uh, there is, as we all know, in critical appraisal of quantitative studies, you can simply look for key characteristics within the study design, and if they're missing, you can stop there and go, no, it didn't meet the criteria, it's out. That's very different in qualitative primary research. There's, there's no clear smoking gun, to be honest, that says if we've got 10 questions and it meets nine then it's a brilliant study but if it only but if it misses this one this one key criteria then it's it's total rubbish and we should put it out this makes it challenging for review teams because you you still have to make a decision right um, but it's got to be a consensus driven decision i mean for me knowing that in jbi there are five questions that align with dependability 
and dependability is an intrinsic process to establishing the transition from experience to action because we want transparent auditable recommendations for practice. Currently, I lean heavily towards favoring those questions on dependability, but actually it's a conversation that has to occur in that review team. Sorry, that's my best answer on that. That's a You sat on the fence. I did. Fair enough. But Peggy did love your answer, so thank you, Craig. Um, as qualitative studies are context dependent, what happens to the context of the individual studies included in the um, qualitative evidence synthesis? That's a great question. That, is a great that actually question. could be another JBI live talk or a high degrees talk at least. So the good thing about this is the way the nature of primary qualitative research embeds the context in the analysis. This of course is utterly different to quantitative research where particularly in uh, experimental designs, you actually seek to take the context out. You control for all the parameters that might influence, right? But in qualitative research, you embrace those, you bring them in. So the context is embedded in the meaning of the findings or what we call analytic data, which might be themes or metaphors or other illustrative data in the paper. The context comes with the finding and the illustration reinforces that context as well. I think that was a good response, but please feel free to put in the chat if you'd like any clarification on that. Um, Santil has asked about your opinion using the Critical Appraisal Skills Program or CASP tool for quality check. It's a real, well, it is a popular tool. It is a very popular tool. It's a popular, well-known tool. Um, not a lot of work has been done looking at what does it really measure and that's interesting right there's there's uh, hundreds of appraisal tools for qualitative research out there this is one of the highest used ones some early work in fact i was involved in that early work looked at what does it measure and it rated high for what's the usability of this research called primary qualitative research, but it rated lower than other instruments on evaluating the trustworthiness, the dependability of qualitative research. And so those are terms that are analogous to internal validity. So it actually rated lower than, for example, the JBI appraisal instrument for determining the quality of a study but it rated very well for enabling users to evaluate the usefulness of a study. And that means, you know, you've got choices to make. It's quite a bit of a long question, so um, bear with me. I get a pen. Qualitative data sets have limited findings that are directly related to lines of actions. How can reviews avoid reinterpretation of findings from included studies and present the findings from the included studies as intended by the original authors without reinterpreting the findings um, for sampling metagration in terms of action or knowledge as the basis of recommendation policy. So would meta aggregation be considered reinterpretation once we, when we're in that process? Yeah, um, look, I hope I, properly answer the question for everyone actually, because this is an important question as well. The, the methods as prescribed in our handbook, as taught in our teaching materials and as fairly extensively published, mean that findings are extracted verbatim from papers. There's no translate one finding into another and then translate those findings into other findings. They're all extracted verbatim. And the analytic process begins once you have all the findings and you start looking for patterns. And that's patterns based on similarity and meaning. So right through the method, if you read the handbook, it'll, it, it really clearly points to, this is a descriptive interpretive approach. 
And that's entirely congruent with transcendental phenomenology. We're trying to get to the, 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 the higher understanding, but it's not an abstract theoretical interpretation of a phenomena of interest. It's actually the essence based on the empirical data that comes out of those papers. And that empirical meaning carries from the findings into the categories, from the categories into the synthesized findings. That's where it could fall down if people then go, well, I've got my synthesized findings, now I'm gonna create some recommendations. Really, in terms of a, a methodology that's underpinned by pragmatism, what review groups normally do is look for the closest alignment from synthesized finding to recommendation or implication for practice. And those can literally be used as quality indicators for clinical practice improvement projects. So the alignment is very, very close. It's not a theoretically interpretive approach to qualitative synthesis. And if somebody wants to do that theoretical modeling approach, then there's brilliant methods out there that do that. But this approach focuses on a descriptive interpretive process to define experience as knowledge that can be used for action. Thank you so much for that, Craig. Please tell me if we have not answered your question or if you have any further fo um, follow up questions, um, just put them in the chat. I will move to a question by Leslie about are there any recommendations for synthesizing both quantitative and qualitative studies through a comprehensive synthesis? Um, Leslie, are we talking about a mixed method synthesis, Craig? I think that's right. I'm, I'm, I know there is a methodology. I know uh, Dr. Lucy Lynn Lizarondo in JBI, who's a dear colleague, she heads a methodology group for that. But I wouldn't be able to do the answer the same level of justice that could be done by referring that question back either to Lucy or to the handbook. Um, Lucy is actually in the webinar. So if Lucy would like to um, just highlight any potential resources for Leslie to be able to do that, that would be great. But I understand if you're unable to Leslie, but um, Lucy, but Leslie, if not, just email JBI education um, at adelaide.edu.au and we'll be able to also direct you to those resources as well. But how do the reviewers know the intention of the original authors who may not consider actionable, actionable knowledge in their findings. Right, so I think we need to separate the concepts here. Um, when somebody does primary qualitative research, by and large, they are not working to a pragmatic perspective. Most qualitative research seeks to explore experiences using the, the predominant methods and in the health sciences, that actually is Heideggerian phenomenology, which has ontological underpinnings, not epistemological. I'm going to get in trouble for that. But also um, grounded theory and basic sort of qualitative descriptive that doesn't have any strong affiliation with any particular methodological philosophic tradition. So primary study authors, they bring, they they bring their ontology with them. They don't adopt one for the particular project. So they want to understand somebody's lived experience from a Heideggerian hermeneutic perspective, say. They're not thinking about actionable knowledge. They're thinking about how do I understand Dyson, this lived experience, this notion of being while I'm in, while these people are in the health sector. What we do as reviewers is really quite different. We look not so much at their philosophic perspective, but we look at whether or not their topic and their methods as published, which is limited, but as published, align with the expressed interests that and knowledge needs that we are trying to meet. So we need to separate uh, the thinking behind primary research and the thinking and drivers behind secondary research, which is qualitative evidence synthesis in this context. They're different drivers. They're communicated differently because they actually have different purposes. Thank you so much, Craig, for that. Um, we're going to have to actually end the question. 
Firstly, I'd like to highlight that um, Lucy, uh, Lucy Lynn Lizabard Rondo has actually put in that uh, link into the chat. So thank you so much for that, Lucy. And Leslie, please uh, use that link to be able to access some more information. Um, if you didn't get, if we didn't get to a question, please, uh, I've put these email into the chat as well, which is jbieducation.adelaide.edu.au. Please um, uh, put in qu any question, write my name in it so that uh, admin staff know to send it to me and I'll make sure that we can get a response for you. Craig, do you mind unsharing your screen so I can share mine so I can announce the next webinar that we uh, plan on doing for the JBI live webinar series. We are very, very excited to announce that our 1st of June, depending on time zones, um, we will actually be having uh, Dr. Sharon Strauss talk about sustaining knowledge translation interventions. If you want to register for what I think will be an incredibly popular webinar, um, we do so after the webinar series um, through JBI Education um, events page, or we, after you complete your evaluation, there will be a link to that page as well. But we hope to see you um, at our next JBI live, live webinar series with Dr. Sharon Strauss and with Dr. Lucy Lynn, um, who I've highlighted as well in this webinar. So we're hoping to see you all there. We will be um, asking when you end uh, the webinar, when you leave, an evaluation form will pop up through SurveyMonkey. We are constantly trying to strive to improve these webinars, to make them useful to the community, um, as we are not going to be able to be here unless because of you, so we want to be able to serve you. So please fill in the evaluation form um, to make our webinars as good as possible for you. I'd also like to direct you to our JBI Education website and to our JBI YouTube channel, which will have this webinar um, for you to be able to look at it um, in the week or so. So thank you so much for coming. That is the formal end of this webinar. And thank you, Dr. Um, uh, Associate Professor Craig Lockwood for your fascinating um, and intriguing uh, discussion into qualitative evidence synthesis. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.